I'm about to study the incorruptible, inerrant Word of God. I open my heart to God's message. I humble my mind to His wisdom, and I rest my hopes on His grace. I will accept His rebukes with repentance, rejoice in His truth by faith, and trust in His promises that can never fail. I can be what it says I can be. I can do what it says I can do. I can change what it says I can change as I trust in His grace and spirit. I covenant with God that I'm ready to learn, I'm ready to grow, and I'm ready to change as I hide His Word in my heart and honor Jesus Christ as the Lord of my life. All right, amen. You may be seated. In our series on Grace Chronicles, we've been using as our kind of our general theme uh, a verse of scripture out of Isaiah 42.3, which is part of one of the servant songs that I've told you several times now, which is a description of the Messiah and what his characteristics will be. And of course, there are many of the, there's four servant songs in Isaiah. And, uh, of course, the most famous is Isaiah 52 and 53, which literally describes the sacrifice and the crucifixion of Jesus Christ 730 years before it happened. But in this particular servant song, it talks about the Messiah and his characteristics. And I want you to read this with me, this little verse. We've been reading it each week. And let's uh, read this characteristic of Jesus, which he fulfilled so perfectly in his earthly ministry. <clears throat> let's read it together. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out until he leaves justice to victory. And of course, we've talked about what that means, and we won't go back over that, but he is in the process of healing and restoring, not breaking and snuffing out. And so, this morning, the title of our message is Second Chance Grace, Second Chance chance grace. So I want to start with a question. Why did he decide to follow Jesus in the first place? He was a fisherman. He was no theologian or religious political leader. He lived in the rugged realities of the sea, the storms, the absence of fish, and the long nights of toil. He had little time to think about high in the sky promises and pursuits. He had a living to make. So why did Simon, who would be renamed by Jesus, Peter the Rock, leave it all behind and follow Jesus? The answer might astonish many modern Christians who often have a very distorted view of the nature of Jesus as a man. We must understand Jesus is the only 200% person in the world. He is 100% God, and he's 100% man in the person of Jesus Christ. And, of course, that is a great mystery, but that's exactly what the Bible declares. And so what is it that was uh, about this man that caused this fisherman, this Peter, to follow Jesus. Well, we can boil it down probably to many things, but I'm going to give you a short, but what I believe is a true statement about Jesus. I think it's because Jesus is compelling. Jesus is compelling. He still is, if you pay attention. And yes, he is compelling because you could not be around him without sensing, unless you were willfully jealous and belligerent, like some of the leaders you couldn't be around him without sensing his divinity, his supernatural love, his compassion, his profound understanding and teaching about life and its true meaning. And to say nothing of his many miracles that he produced hundreds of miracles because of his love and compassion on the people around him. But there are also other reasons why Jesus is compelling. Uh one of the reasons, which also may not seem that big to us, but it was big, I can promise you, in the life of the apostles in that first century, because it was a very different culture than ours, and that is that he is unbounded by convention and teaches a new way to live. 
Uh, now, this is more startling, as I said, than many of us can comprehend. For Jews in particular, your life in the first century was controlled by tradition, laws, regulations, and social rules, and expectations which you did not challenge on pain of expulsion and socially being rejected. However, this Nazarene rabbi made some amazing claims about his authority to cut a new unconventional path to do things differently. He didn't have to do it the old way. He didn't have to submit always to tradition, especially where it went contrary to the Word of God, and he claimed to be the authority on the Word of God. And not the least of his claims, which was in this venue of his authority, comes from John 14, 6, where Jesus said this, I am the way and the truth and the life. And then Jesus added, no one comes to the Father except through me. Now, those are pretty towering claims. And no one could make those claims unless they were indeed who he claimed to be, God incarnate. When Jesus says he's the truth, the life, we make much of it. For example, he says he's the truth. The Greek is, is healathia. And healathia is meant to make us understand that Jesus is the truth about reality. God, in other words, the cosmic battle in our world, sin and death and salvation and science and etc., etc., ad infinitum. Uh, any area of unspoiled reality which you touch, you find that Jesus is the source of his existence and his actuality. When Jesus says he is life, he zoe, uh, the word zoe means, as it is used about Jesus and God in the New Testament, means uncreated life, the source of life in regard to Jesus. He is not just bios, he created bios, that's biological life, but he is zoe, the source of life. And when John talks about him in his first chapter of his gospel as being life, he talks about how he is the creator, how through him all things came to be, and nothing came to be uh, that has come to be without him, and that his, he is the light, and his light was the life of men. And so Jesus is Hezoe, and he's the only one through which we can find eternal life. But when Jesus says that he is he hadas, the way. We kind of shallow out. We think only in one direction, the way to heaven. And of course, yes, <laughs> he is that. Aren't you glad he is the way to heaven? He's our hope of heaven. But he's more. Jesus comes to cut a whole new way through the jungle of human confusion and traditions and false religions about life and how to live it in this world. You do understand we are pr living in the present age, which is the last age before the age to come. But while we live in this age that is soon going to die, and we are getting close, I believe, to the end of this age, that's why we're talking a lot about, I think we're training now, the kingdom generation, and that's important for us as we begin to, to we will continue talking about that toward the end of summer and end of the fall, as we talk about our, the school we're hoping to birth, they are our classical school. But the important thing here is to understand that as this age we're living in this age. Nonetheless, we also have been invaded ahead of time by the age to come through the resurrection life of the resurrected Jesus through his spirit. And we are already, if we are believers and followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, we are already resurrected people living with eternal life inside of us in this present age. And so we are in the world, but not of it, because we're of another world. We're always looking up, because that's where our hope is. That's where our destiny is. That's where our home is. This world is not our home, as we used to sing in the old days. I don't know anybody would remember that. I'm just a passing through, you know. But we are those who live between the ages, so to speak. We still are in this present world, but we have the, literally the realities of the world to come inside of us. So we need to remember that the key to appropriating Jesus is to obey his central invitation. Come, 
follow me. And what he does for his disciples is cut a new path through the jungle of all the confusion of this world, and it's getting more and more confusing all the time. In fact, I sometimes feel like we're not in a jungle anymore. We're in a swamp up to our neck. But the point is, Jesus is still blazing a path and saying, follow me, because he knows where he's going, and he knows where he needs to lead us. And yes, that does mean follow me to heaven. But it also means follow me in learning how to live in this present age and world and make it to heaven by way of the cross. In this present age, the cross must be an ultimate reality for us because no one gets to resurrection life in heaven who have not embraced the end of themselves. In other words, as Jesus would put it, the death to their old self in the cross. That is the essence of of what it means to follow Jesus on this side of reality. We have to die to who we are so we can come alive to who we're supposed to be. We can see how compelling Jesus is by his disciples' response to his invitation to follow him. In fact, in Matthew, we hear Jesus give an invitation to his disciples. And here's how Matthew records that in Matthew chapter 4. It says, At once, oida eutheo, oida eutheo. And this word oida eutheo means at once or immediately, instantly. And he's talking about Peter and Andrew here. They left their nets and followed him. And then he walks down the shore a little ways and it says, Jesus called them, referring to here to James and John, and immediately, and again, the same thing, oi de euthao is used, and it means they, James, left the boat and their father and followed him. So at once, immediately, instantly, they left their nests and followed him in verses 20 and 22. Now pay attention. Why did Matthew not simply say they followed him? If that all used both in verse 20 and 22 to convey this action means without delay, without any questions, without any pauses, without any hesitation, straight ahead into the call that Jesus gave them. And the call was, come, leave everything, and follow me. Now, we need to remember that the Gospels are short stories about the life of Christ. And the Spirit, through Matthew, carefully chooses every word so it will convey exactly everything, in, it will create the exact picture, we might say, of what happened and what God wants us to understand. And so Matthew just doesn't say, they followed him. He says immediately, instantly, without hesitation, they followed him. Now, think about this. If you were Peter, John, Andrew, James, do you think that might be kind of unusual? I mean, you're just leaving your occupation. You're leaving everything you know. You instantly just leave it behind and say yes on one invitation. I think some of us might have had some questions. What do you think? Maybe something like, uh, is this going to be hard or easy? Can can we kind of talk this over a little bit? I'd like to know something first. Is this going to be a little hard or easy? Is this going to be a short-term or a long-term commitment? (laughs) Do I have to work weekends? (laughs) Does this come with a 401k, you know? I guess today it'd be maybe a 200.5K. Everything's getting smaller. I don't know. Or if you really wanted to sound spiritual, you could. Uh, you might respond, you know, Jesus, let me pray about this for two weeks and get back to you. <laughs> he didn't do any of that. Jesus said, come. They dropped everything immediately and they went. Jesus is compelling. And I don't think we can hardly wrap our minds around that. We can see how compelling Jesus is in another way, by the way he relates to the kind of men he called to be his disciples. Now, these men, at least these first four we've, we're looking at here in Matthew 4, were fishermen. 
they were not fly fishermen, they were fishermen. <laughs> There's a difference, okay? They spent the night out on the Sea of Galilee throwing nets in the water and dragging the men full of fish with their bare hands. These guys had biceps, okay? They worked all night. They understood how to manage storms. They, and, and if they hadn't paid close attention to the prohibitions in, in Leviticus, they may have had great big tattoos on their arms. They were the bikers of their day. They were not going to follow the wimpy Jesus pictured in those Sunday school handouts we used to get as kids. Any of you remember some of those? You know, the ones where Jesus looks like he's anemic and maybe a little sick and soft and maybe timid and, egg, and a little bit of an egghead who spends all of his time indoors and he's white and pale and, and kind of got, you know, limp wrist. Uh, that's not the Jesus of the Bible. That's not the Jesus the Bible tells us about. In fact, Jesus spent the first 30 years of his life before he began his ministry as a carpenter. And we, we kind of misunderstand that because we interpret that in our own context. The, the Greek word that is used for carpenter to describe Jesus is, is tecton in the Greek. And it doesn't mean just someone who works with wood. It means someone mostly who probably spent more time working with stone and carving. You know, he would harvest stone. He would uh, cut stone. He would, you know, he would uh, make stairs and uh, he would make different kinds of houses and different things. But he was, work he was a worker in stone. <laughs> Coring it, cutting it, shaping it, fitting it together to build buildings, walls, and stairs. This was hard, back-breaking work which required great physical stamina and strength. Jesus, like they had a pretty good set of biceps on him, too. That may not be how you picture him, but that's who he would have had to have been physically. And he walks in among these bikers, if you please, and commands respect because he's compelling Dr. Joel Stoles said he had a friend who had been part of the special forces in the military who told him about his own conversion. And he said the key to his conversion was how he needed to get a proper view of who Jesus was as a man. He said, I, I had a false view of him. He said, I didn't want to follow a guy I could beat up. <laughs> kind of silly in some ways, but he said, that's where I was. And he said, I wanted to follow the Jesus of Revelation riding down out of the skies on a white horse with the title King of Kings and Lord of Lords written on his thigh. Is that a tattoo? I, I don't know. Anyway, but he's the compelling Jesus. <laughs> and Peter left everything to follow him. And time after time, he made it clear as the years progressed, and he walked with Jesus, that he was all in. I'm all in, Lord. I'm with you. Yet Peter would discover that he needed more grace than he realized. He considered himself fully devoted to Jesus. He said even to the point of dying for him if necessary. Yet there were some unwelcome revelations and realizations. Out in the front of Peter, concerning his own heart and life, and you know, so often the same is true of us. So I want to talk about how Jesus poured grace on Peter. And to do that, we need to start and look at why he needed so much grace. And we're going to see how Jesus does that after his resurrection. But let's stop and look for a moment how Jesus even poured grace on him before he goes to the cross. Because he, he interacts with Peter in a very unique way. I want to talk about provenient grace again. And provenient grace, remember, is a grace that goes before. It's a grace that responds before you even know you have a need. It's the grace that enables you, that God is working even before you even knew him, maybe. It's working to lift you to a point where you will hear the gospel, respond to the gospel, and accept God's saving grace. But the point is, Jesus is going to pour some provenient grace on Peter because Peter doesn't know what's coming up and what's ahead of him. And Jesus is trying to help Peter with this. Let's read this together. 
Jesus has just said something about the fact that all of them are going to abandon him. And Peter says, oh, no, <laughs> not me. And then Jesus responds this way. He said, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith will not fail. And when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. But Peter replied, Lord, I'm ready to go with you even to prison and to death. Even if all fall away on account of you, I will, I never will. I tell you the truth, Jesus answered. This very night before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. But Peter declared, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And he meant it. He meant it with everything he understood. And all the other disciples said the same. Now, what have we just witnessed? We have just witnessed Peter's blind spot. Peter's blind spots. But before you get hard on Peter, we need to stop and think about how this might apply to us as well. It is almost inconceivable that Peter could not connect all the dots regarding Jesus' warning to him about his upcoming failure. It's inconceivable, that is, until we see how true this characteristic can be concerning who we are. Peter obviously believed Jesus was the Messiah, the Son of God. And what that meant was that he was God in the flesh. And as we know, every Jew knew that God was omniscient and knew everything. That had been his great confession in Caesarea Philippi in Matthew 16, 16. You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Peter knew that. And yet, regarding himself and his own self-knowledge and understanding, somehow he pushed Jesus and his warning aside with a I know better than you attitude, which of course, if he had stopped for only a moment to seriously consider it, he would have realized was completely preposterous. But we do this all the time, don't we? We assume, oh, I know myself. I, I, I know my own heart. And then we find ourselves doing things we didn't believe we would do and failing where we never thought we would fail. You see, uh, the reason many people stay away from God is first, they don't understand who God is because if they understood, they would run toward him. But secondly, they don't understand who they are and they don't want God to tell them. They don't like his assessment. They want to continue to live in their illusions. But you have to accept who Jesus says you are now and then give that self that you are now to him because he promises to make it into a new creation self if you put it in his hands. Because you cannot become the person Jesus wants you to be until you embrace honestly who you are. Yet, like Peter, we may confess that Jesus is God and that God knows all there is to know and he is Lord and in charge, yet somehow we can have a grave blind spot regarding our own spiritual virtue, strength, and perception. And I suppose if I paused right here this morning and said, you know, let's have a testimony service and everybody was going to be, you know, bluntly honest, probably every one of us could testify to a failure where God warned us, either in his word or through his spirit or both, and we just blundered ahead, and it didn't work out so well. Why? Because we all have a tendency to trust our own assessment. God tries to tell us who we really are, and we reject it. We say things like, oh, that can't be me. I would never do such a thing. I'm the one who is above all that, even if others are not. Ever heard somebody say this? I can't believe I did that. I remember saying that one time after I'd blown it royally and I heard the Holy Spirit say to me, I know you can't believe it, but that's who you are. And I didn't like it, but I had to embrace it before it could be transformed and changed and healed. I can't believe that I, I would do that. Well, 
God says, I do. In other words, we will allow that God is right about everything, yet irrationally make an exception in regard to what we have determined to be true about ourselves. So let me give a few examples. For example, we imagine ourselves to be more virtuous, perceptive, and spiritually stronger than we actually are. We blunder into places God has not sent us and imagine ourselves strong enough to survive to only end up in failure and regret. Every time we violate God's commands because of temptation, we are telling God we know better than he does. God says, for example, you don't really want to fornicate with that person. You don't want the results. You don't want to commit adultery. But we push past his warnings, both in Scripture and by his Spirit, and we tell ourselves that this is what we really want and need. In the end, we stand bound by regret, guilt, shame, and stubborn relationship chaos and fracture. Also, we are warned by the principles of Scripture. And this is very important in our culture and the Spirit speaking to our spirit that we should not indulge in certain kinds of entertainment that co compromise our sense of the sacred. You know, there's nothing wrong with having a good laugh and, and good entertainment and watching a good movie. There's nothing wrong with any of that. But, you know, there are lines to be crossed, and the world is always trying to push you over the line, right? And if you don't know that, you're not very aware. And God is telling us, watch those lines. Your life is sacred. You don't need that stuff in your mind and in your heart. But we decide that we know better than God. Even if we do not realize that's what we're deciding, and we indulge, telling ourselves, oh, it won't affect me. It might affect somebody else, but not me. I know better. Then we wake up one day. And we realize all the delight and passion is gone from our relationship with Jesus. Gone is our commitment to his kingdom and church. The spiritual fire has gone out and we find it hard to have any joy in Christ by which to stir ourselves awake and back to a vital faith. We have slowly descended through our indulgence into a spiritual coma and can't find the willpower to stir ourselves off our couch of worldly comforts. We thought we knew better than God. We were wrong. While such an attitude is irrational, it is unfortunately common to fallen human beings. Yet it is so innate to our fallen, self-centered, self-sufficient attitudes that we seldom notice just how foolish we are being in the moment we are making our big assertion, either by words or actions or both. And Peter made his big assertion. The Lord said, Peter, you're going to fail. And Peter says, no, Lord, you're wrong. Not me. Everybody else may, but not me. And so often that is a picture of who we can become if we're not careful. But notice the grace Jesus gave Peter up front. Provenient grace. Grace beforehand. Now, Peter didn't accept it, but in the end, it would come to bear on his restoration, I believe. He would be forever grateful that Jesus prayed for him ahead of time to recover, even though he denied that he would fall. When he did fall, he was grateful that Jesus had prayed for him that he would recover when he fell. So we've seen Peter's blind spot and possibly even some of our own. But now we come to beat Peter's bitter spot, and many of us have been there. Peter did fail. <laughs> and like everything else he did, he did it in a big way, loudly and crudely. Yet even in this moment, we see the grace <clears throat> Jesus had prayed for acting on and for Peter. As Peter is making his final denial while calling down curses on himself, if he were not telling the truth, which he was not because he was lying, we are told of a stark moment of horrible self-realization that instantly came on him. And let me give it to you in a harmonized it's a version of Luke and what Luke and Mark record about this because John and Matthew don't add anything that's any different. But this is, this is basically the whole 
the, the, the larger picture of what happened. And it says this. About an hour later, another person asserted, Certainly this fellow was with Jesus, for he is a Galilean. Peter replied, Man, I don't know what you're talking about. He began to call down curses on himself, and he swore to them, I don't know this man you're talking about. Just as he was speaking, the rooster crowed. The Lord turned and looked straight at Peter. Then Peter remembered the word the Lord had spoken to him. Before the rooster crows today, you will disown me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. This is Peter's bitter spot. This moment of bitter realization and bitter remorse became, I believe, because of Jesus' prayer and provenient grace, a moment of soul-rending repentance for Peter. He didn't have to repent just of his sins. He had to repent of who he thought he was. He had to give it up. I'm Peter who's adequate. I'm Peter who can do it all by myself. I'm Peter who's self-sufficient. He had to repent of that Peter. That day, Peter beheld his empty self-assurance, his powerless good intentions, and his stubborn self-autonomy. Yeah, he had good intentions. When he swung the sword in the Garden of Gethsemane, he wasn't aiming at an ear. He was aiming at a head. He really knew that this could cost him his life. He was ready to die with Jesus. He meant it, but he didn't know where the real battle was at. It would come with a little maid pointing her finger at him and, some, and a guy following up on it and pointing at him and saying, you're one of them, and he would begin to deny it. And that day, Peter withheld who he, or began to see who he really was. But it would take a second touch of grace for Peter to be able to embrace the Peter Jesus had determined to make him. And so in the last turn for this morning, because I've turned this into a part one, part two, I just want to give you this, and we're going to now move just beyond the resurrection, and we're going to look at something very powerful. And I call this pursuing grace, pursuing grace. And here's what I want to draw your attention to, the postscript. There's a postscript, and if you're not paying close attention you could miss it all together in the scriptures when you're reading through the Gospels. It is such a simple, short postscript, almost like an afterthought, added on to the primary message the angel sent the women to deliver to the disciples. And sometimes we get that all confused because the Gospels record various aspects of that whole event, and we sometimes get them all jumbled, so we need to kind of sort it out a little bit. But this postscript that was added on by the angel that the women were delivered was very important. Yet I doubt any of us can imagine the impact this postscript had on Peter once he learned that it had come from the angel who was Jesus' messenger. And this postscript was added for three reasons. One of them was that Peter likely was not with the other apostles, but was at another location, and John was with him, we find out later, this is what John's version of the resurrection morning clearly indicates in John chapter 20. Peter may have been excluding himself from the other apostles because he felt he had invalidated himself. He didn't belong with them any longer. John, who was very close to Peter as their future ministry together will reveal, had likely joined him to try to console Peter and himself because the future still looked rather bleak to all of them. They didn't know Jesus was risen from the dead yet. They didn't understand it all. If so, it is likely that an important decision was made among the women that was a direct result of this postscript I'm talking about. And so let's read it, and you'll see what I'm talking about. Mark 16, 5 says, As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in white, a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. Don't be alarmed, he said. You're looking for Jesus the Nazarene who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples, and now notice this, and Peter. Tell his disciples, he didn't include Peter in that, and Peter. 
He is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. Those words, and Peter, and Peter. There is so much grace wrapped up into those, if you're Peter, that you can hardly comprehend it. The angel seems to know that Peter is not with the other disciple, so he makes a point that they should be sure that Peter, too, is informed. So it seems that these women, uh, Mary, the mother of James, and Salome, and then Mary Magdalene, made a decision, and Mary, the mother of James, and Salome, they run to where all the other disciples are at, the apostles are at, but Mary Magdalene goes running to where she knows Peter is, and find, discovers later that John is with him as well. And that's what you read about in the 20th chapter of John. And that's what we're intended to understand. So Mary Magdalene goes by herself. And in John chapter 20, uh, it starts off by just talking about Mary Magdalene going to the tomb. It doesn't mean the other women didn't go. It means that she's the one who's the focus because she's the one who will run to Peter and John. And that was John's part of the story. And so... John says of Mary Magdalene, he says, so she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple. So notice they're not with the others, the one Jesus loved. They have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciples started for the tomb. This accounts for the fact of Mary's message resulted in only two disciples running to the tomb, Peter and John. We are told that the message of the other women was not believed by the other disciples. In fact, Luke 24, 11 says that when these women told the other disciples they didn't believe them, their words seemed to them like nonsense. So none of those other disciples act on it. They just went, yeah, you've got to be crazy. You're just being emotional. You know, you, you don't understand what you've seen. None of them did anything. Now, Luke will, in the very next verse, point out that Peter, however, got up and ran to the tomb. He's not saying Peter's with the other disciples. He's talking about the fact that Peter got informed too, and he mentions the fact, and that was Mary Magdalene, we learned in John chapter 20, and he says he did go to the tomb, and we know that John went with him, and Mary Magdalene followed after them, and they examine everything at the tomb, and then she stays behind when they leave questioning and as John says he had started to believe in the resurrection because of the grave clothes he had seen being empty like an empty cocoon and then we know that's when Mary meets the resurrected Lord and then he tells her go and tell all the disciples and that she does now there's two other reasons why these words and Peter were likely added and let me give them to you. The first one is it could be an acknowledgement that Peter has indeed renounced his relationship of being a disciple with Jesus. And we'll do, deal with that more next week. So he is addressed separate from the other disciples. Go tell my disciples, his disciples, and Peter, who's not being listed among the disciples at this moment. Such things were indeed sacred and serious. They were not taken lightly in the ancient world in which Peter lived because he had a covenant relationship with Jesus. He had vowed to follow his rabbi, and he had betrayed his rabbi. So Peter is, in a way, informed that God recognizes his present status, and it is no small issue. But the second thing is that we understand is that Jesus, through his messenger, the angel, is including Peter in the circle of those who are to be informed of the most wonderful event in all of history, that Jesus has risen from the dead, defeated death, hell, and the grave, and that a new creation has begun and a new humanity has begun. And Jesus is saying, Peter, you may be excluding yourself, but I'm drawing a circle that includes you, and I'm seeing to it that you get informed because I'm still calling you to belong to me. Wow, that's powerful. That's powerful. How much grace is conveyed to Peter's broken heart and spirit by those two little words of inclusion and Peter. Go tell his disciples, oh, and Peter. Wow. We'll end by looking at this, the private touch of grace. It's something we don't know much about, so we can't say much about it. In message number three of this study, we talked about grace walk. And you remember that Jesus, after his resurrection that day, 
appeared to two men. Cleopas is the only one we have a name for. We don't know who the other disciples name. But they walked together with Jesus for a whole afternoon on the way to Emmaus. Jesus kept them from recognizing him so he could reveal the scriptures to them and make it clear that all this was the fulfillment of scriptures that had been written 700, 800, and in the case of the garden, of uh, the gates of the garden, thousands of years before, and that it had all been fulfilled so they could, would be equipped to present the fact of his resurrection. It's not just something they experienced, but something that is written down in scripture ahead of time as prophecy, which only God can do. And then he allowed them to recognize him And then he vanished from their sight. And you remember, they're so excited. It's after dark and it's dangerous, but still they get up and they run the whole eight miles back to Jerusalem to find the other disciples because they want to tell them, we met the risen Lord. We met the risen Lord. When they get there and get inside, they discover, yeah, several people have met the risen Lord. They hear about Mary Magdalene's encounter. She saw Jesus at the tomb after Peter and John left. And then someone says something else that there has been another encounter, a private touch of grace on Peter. And look at what they discover. It says, they got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven and those with them assembled together and say, it is true, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. Remember, that's his original name, Simon, Peter. Wow. We are not told anything about what this meeting of Jesus and Peter, what happened. We're not told anything. Paul would years later confirm in 1 Corinthians 15, 5 that it actually happened. He would mention Jesus appearing to Peter. Yet, can we not imagine the emotions and overwhelming gratitude that Peter must have felt when Jesus showed up to embrace him and not to judge him? He deserved judgment. He deserved rejection. But Jesus showed up to embrace him. And it's interesting that where do we find him next? We find him back among the other disciples. He's there now. He's with them. Remember the last expression Peter had seen on Jesus' face was when Jesus turned to look at him immediately after his third cursing denial when he swore that he didn't know Jesus or wasn't associated with him in any way. Jesus looked straight at Peter and I'm sure with grieved compassion in his eyes. But how different the countenance of the risen Lord who looks at Peter with loving compassion and embraces him says you're forgiven maybe maybe he took time to tell him i've just died for the sins of the whole world and that includes your sins and your betrayal and you are forgiven peter you are welcomed back wow go tell my disciples and peter grace in the person of jesus bestowed a second chance a chance to succeed where before he had failed. And in that moment, I can believe that Jesus washed away for Peter his old stubborn self-reliance and attempted self-sufficiency. Peter had surely suffered much during the three days since his Thursday night or what the Jews would call his early Friday failure. And though what he suffered was minuscule compared to what Jesus suffered, Because nonetheless, Jesus had suffered for the sins of the whole world. He had suffered in defeating the principalities and powers of darkness. But Peter's suffering was self-inflicted, and Jesus' suffering was vicariously self-inflicted for the sake of the world. But for both of them, as Jesus embraced Peter and said, you're forgiven, it was over. The victorious resurrected Jesus changed Peter in that moment more than he could imagine. His whole future life would emerge from this glorious moment of grace and forgiveness. But Jesus had more grace he would bestow on Peter to be continued next week. Because he's not through with Peter yet. He's not through restoring. He's not through. And we're going to read one of the most amazing accounts in the New Testament as we take it apart and see what's really transpiring in this conversation. We're going to be bowl over. Let me finish by saying this. 
Let me ask some questions. Application. Like Peter, have you failed the Lord time and again? Don't give me your Sunday morning face. Have you? Well, if you have, I hope you ran to Jesus. Because I got news for you. You don't need to isolate yourself from Jesus and his other disciples of the church because you feel invalidated. What you need to do is run to Jesus. You need to run to the tomb and see the empty grave clothes, so to speak, and realize he's alive. And then you need to hear the message he sends. Go tell my disciples and Peter or Mary or John or Richard or Becky, whoever it is, go tell them, yes, the circle is drawn big enough for them. They're still in. Come. You see, we don't run from his grace. We run toward his grace. Jesus wants you to realize from how he responded to Peter's failure that you are not beyond the reach of his restoring and redeeming grace. Are you willing to run so to speak, to the tomb and there discover the beginning of a life you cannot imagine. Jesus is the Redeemer that gives second chance grace. And we've all needed it, haven't we? And we all need to embrace it. Let's pray. Father, thank you this morning. Thank you for teaching us through the life of Peter some amazing things about how you do not break the bruised reed. You do not snuff out the smoldering wick, but rather you heal, you restore, you rekindle, and you make us useful for your kingdom. And not only did you forgive and redeem Peter, but you would rekindle his call and his purpose to be a life transformer, a world shaker, and I pray, Lord, that you will help each of us here today to realize no matter what has happened in our life, no matter how we failed, we can run to you, not away from you. And if we do, we will hear you say, yes, and you. Yes, my grace is for you too. I pray that we will all open up to that grace. In Jesus' name, amen.